thanks so much and good afternoon to everybody. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, Woodstock, 1969, yes, I was there. And I think I had a very good time, uh, <laughs> as best I can remember. Um, I want to say thank you for inviting me here. Um, it is not often that I'm asked to do a three-hour summary of cultural policy in America. And uh, Mari tells me that that will not be happening today either. So, uh, but uh, Sue has been a terrific board member, and I thank her. We had an opportunity uh, at Americans for the Arts to honor Paul Allen a few years back um, in New York at our National Arts Awards. And the, um, there are so many other people here who I'd love to uh, recognize, too many. But I would like to just say that um, Karen Hanen is now your new state director of the State Arts Council. Had a wonderful opportunity to work with her over time. Um, Mari at the Arts Fund. Uh, you know, I, rec I saw that in 1969, when I was at Woodstock, this organization was founded. And um, whatever I've done, you've given away $65 million in that time period. So I think that's pretty wonderful. Got a chance over the years to work with Peter uh, Donnelly, who was on our board, and Jim Toon. And there's a lot of great friends from the local arts agency scene here, whether it's uh, Rhonda Billerbeck from Kent, Washington, or the Four Culture folks, or the Seattle Arts Commission. Uh, great people. And one last person I'd like to mention, um, Bill Moskin, uh, uh, who's here, was on the search committee 29 years ago, ago that hired me for this position. So thank you, Bill. I'm still trying to live up to the, uh, the, the uh, mandate that you guys gave me. Uh, I want to thank you all here. You bring the gift, the great gift, the secret weapon that America needs right now. A partner in the solution to so many of America's uh, many, many problems, the arts. Uh, I also want to applaud you because you bring the economic asset, uh, the resource, the partnership that um, the arts are in America. 3.2% of gross domestic product, bigger than anybody knows, bigger than anybody understands. We have to keep reminding people of this. What's the return on investment for all of that? Well, the gift of art itself is its own reward, but also creativity and innovation, which every business in America craves. The well-lived life for the individual, the self-actualized child, um, the opportunity to have a path to understand better who we are in this complex 21st century America. Um, all that and the economic impact too. Now for me, I want to thank Seattle for a very special personal gift, and that is um, Diane Brace, uh, who danced for five years here with Pacific Northwest Ballet, <clears throat> and then 20 years ago, uh, you sent her to DC to work for one year as a fellow at the National Endowment for the Arts, where we met, and uh, she is my life partner and my wife. So <clears throat> thank you for that. Now, she gets to continue to, to work uh, for and with Seattle folks. She's on that same board that gave me the national award, but she wasn't on the board at the time, uh, and works with Josh LaBelle, uh, Seattle Theater Group, and uh, learned part of her fundraising skills here at PNB. Um, which uh, she has taken to national public radio. Now, this uh, is not my very favorite speaking forum. I like no slides and no charts so that I can speak to you unencumbered by accuracy uh, or fact <laughs> and then slip back to our nation's capital, which is our custom in Washington, D.C. But today I have charts, um, and so I'm held to the truth. But the charts that I have are more like an old-fashioned home slideshow with uh, family pictures. But I do want to say that um, PNB has a place of honor in our home, as this shows, and also uh, the Benke family does because of the long-term support uh, for PNB and, and on the board. So I thank you for that. Now, my job is to work for more resources in the arts and for arts education in America, as you do here. And uh, I know that that cannot be done alone. That can only be done with all of us um, working together. Now, my path to get there was a bit different. Mom wanted me to be a dentist. Dad wanted me to be a lawyer. I chose creative writing, specializing in poetry, where the big bucks are. <laughs> Sherman knows this. And uh, when I got out, unlike Sherman, um, all the poet jobs were taken. 
I scoured the classifieds. I was not able to find it. But what I did discover was that poems are powerful too. And uh, here is one written by uh, William Carlos Williams, which I know is one of Tree's favorites. Very brief. It is difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably each day for lack of what is found there, for lack of what's found in poetry or art uh, or craft um, or ballet. Uh, art is important. It's important for all the reasons I just said, and America sometimes reluctantly and often even unknowingly, unfortunately, thinks this too. Um, we see some 80,000 nonprofit arts organizations in America today. That's up from 7,000 when our National Endowment for the Arts was begun in 1965. Audiences, no matter what you hear, are collectively at an all-time high. And despite a lot of bad news, there's more money being invested in uh, the arts and culture today than ever before. The Wall Street Journal a few years ago declared America a nation of culture. Its uh, indicators were that public, public radio stations had tripled over a 10-year period. 82% of our public received high school diplomas versus 33% in 1950. But the big one, U.S. consumption of red table wine was up 150% in the last 10 years. So all those wine and cheese benefits that we do are hugely important um, to the, to the long-term economy. Now, it took us 38,000 years to get there. 38,000 years ago. Think about cave art. Uh, a lot of concepts were born 38,000 years ago, like, for example, the concept of, or the phrase, your cave or mine. <laughs> Started way back then. Um, first public artists in, America, in, in the world. The first art critics, I'm sure, were along at that particular time. The first philanthropists. Um, and uh, fundraisers came about. Somebody had to go out and get the meat while these people painted. Um, destination marketing, corporate relocation, cultural tourism. If you think about it, all of that has been with us since the very, very beginning. Um, now, one of the things that when we look at America, uh, we see that art and, and uh, culture in our country, I think, has been a series of surges forward and big setbacks. First big setback, Columbus in 1492, uh, the first cultural tourist. Now, if you think about it, before Columbus, the Native American community pretty much had it together. Before 1492, everything was uh, uh, involved the arts. Art was part of cooking and ritual and shelter and clothing. Uh, in fact, many Native American cultures have no word for art itself. It's part of the entire fabric of society. But think about who came after Columbus. Conquistadors, westward expansionists, uh, religious people fleeing religious persecution, slaves, indentured servants. This is not your typical artsy crowd. This is a group of people who are trying to survive, who came to a place where they had to apply practical skills. And that concept of practicality, unlike most places in the world, is still at the core of our American society. Next big setback, pilgrims, 1620, followed by Puritans. You've seen the pictures. This was a grim group. <laughs> they outlawed dance. They outlawed theater. They even outlawed certain colors, and the New England landscape even today uh, reflects that uh, policy of a long, long time ago. So for uh, uh, 400 or maybe even 500 years, our pragmatic nation has been a slow, reluctant participant uh, to embrace culture as a community-wide or nationwide policy. And that is why organizations like Americans for the Arts or the Arts Fund uh, exist. So this morning, as I prepared for this talk, um, I thought about how I got up here and I discovered it was not pretty. It all began with a lie in 1975. Or, let's say, a, a creative phrasing of the truth. Or marketing, as we've come to call that to today. <laughs> in January of 1975, a group of us invented the concept of the New England Artist Festival and Showcase. We called it New England's largest gathering of artists, craftspeople, performers, poets, and other creators. Um, of course, it had not happened yet. We had no idea if it would be the largest gathering or if anybody would come at all. But in rural western Massachusetts in May, 
20,000 people showed up. It was my first marketing venture, too, because we charged 99 cents a ticket. Uh, my first crisis, because every thrifty rural New Englander wanted their penny. And so I went out and found rolls of pennies to, uh, to pay them back. But I discovered that I built a relationship with all the stores that made the change. The 300 white dove symbolic peace release turned out to be scruffy, mean pigeons. They proceeded to fly up 20 feet and then come down and land and relieve themselves in all of the craft booths. And I know my friends from the Craft Emergency Relief Fund who are here uh, today. Uh, it's a different kind of relief, but um, they are here and understand what that kind of a problem would be. And then volunteer security force. Now, there are certain juxtapositions of words that you have to be very careful about. Volunteer security is such a juxtaposition. They showed up with uh, uh, riot gear, white helmets, billy clubs, and this was not the kind of community image uh, that we wanted. And finally, the hot air balloon promotion. It made it 10 feet up into, into the air in front of a, a, a radio station, two radio stations and a television station carrying a waving, smiling mayor of Northampton, Massachusetts. And uh, it, then it came crashing down sidewards with an unexpected gust of wind dragging the basket and his honor 100 yards across the three county fairgrounds and over two Smith College interns. <laughs> I was completely hooked. The energy, the excitement, the arts. Uh, but by mid-afternoon, when all the sound stages were alive with uh, activity and the, and, and the food vendors were happy with where they were finally situated, and the craft booths and the visual art exhibits were full of people, there was a moment of coming together, a moment of community like I had never experienced before. And that is an additional value that we bring in the arts. And you know it, you in this room, and we need to let others know it and others see it. Now, there's good news out there today. Lots of activity, lots of young artists, and uh, th these are all young artists from, a from an organization called Young Arts, prodigies in high school. Um, they get honored at the White House, and then I take them out with me to Congress or to the U.S. Conference of Mayors or to the National Association of Counties, places like that, to make the case. I can talk, they can show. Um, they also uh, are part of what is the other side of the arts, the economic value. You take a look at those 80,000 nonprofit arts organizations, they have $135 billion worth of economic uh, activity. Nobody knows that. 4.1 million jobs, nobody knows that. And $22 billion coming back to federal, state, and local tax coffers. The arts are a secret weapon, as I said before, and in this case, a secret weapon for the US economy. And right here in Seattle, it's um, 447 million in the city alone, uh, supporting some 10,000 jobs, almost 11,000 jobs, and returning uh, uh, 38 million in taxes. Uh, if you go to the region and you add in the for-profit area, which we're able to do by working with Dun and Bradstreet, we're able to actually pinpoint with a map any zip code in America and tell you exactly how many arts organizations, nonprofit and for profit, are there and exactly how many jobs are generated. And in this region, there are 14,000 uh, organizations that exist and 42,000 um, uh, uh, jobs that are, are directly generated, directly, not economic impact, by the for-profit arts. Uh, in a conversation with Sylvia Wolf last night, uh, she talked about in an NPR report that uh, Seattle is the fastest growing city in the country, fastest growing city in the country. Um, she, she went on top of a building in South Lake Union and called me in with a report this morning that said she saw 17 cranes at work. So there's a lot of activity happening, and I think you need to ask the question, we all do in every community in America, does um, the funding for the arts keep up with, does the investment in the arts keep up with that growth? I can tell you in cities all across the country that want to compete with you, that is what they are doing. In Denver, the sales tax that they passed, generating some $45 million a year in Minnesota, the statewide um, effort that they did, uh, uh, partnering the natural community with the arts community to generate some $50 million a year. Um, in Cincinnati, the cigarette tax was their idea. In Portland, Oregon, an education uh, uh, tax that they've put into place. So uh, what we're seeing is 
that things like, and I, I know you had a, a Cultural As Access Washington program that you were trying uh, to put into place here in this state, things like that, investment in the arts to keep a competitive edge are something uh, that's happening all across the country. Now, when we look at these creative industries nationally, we see that there's some 750,000 businesses in the U.S. involved um, in this. 4.2% um, of all businesses in America. 4.2%. And that does not include um, the 2.2 million artists independent of this who work over half time uh, in the arts and the U.S. Bureau of, of Labor Statistics tracks them. So, at Americans for the Arts, nationally, what do we believe? Well, we're the national organization to advance arts and arts education for everybody, in every community. And we were the organization that advocated a half century ago to create the National Endowment for the Arts and all the state arts agencies and all the local arts councils and arts commissions across the country. And that's the public money. And then David Rockefeller came to us and asked us to help start and have uh, the Business Committee for the Arts, looking at the private money and all of the local arts agencies um, that exist out there. And so it's a, it's a mix of diversified funding, but three things make that happen. One, leaders like you, leaders like you that in a community help others get involved and push the dime forward. Secondly, and this is one we all in this country need to do a better job on, telling the story about the various values of the arts, like a few of the ones that I've just talked about. And finally, old-fashioned uh, advocacy, or what I like to call decision-maker education, both in the uh, public sector and in the private sector. Um, but the value of the arts goes far beyond, far beyond um, the arts themselves. Uh, you take a look at Albert Einstein, and he found uh, that he got inspiration from uh, the arts, from the violin, for his science and for his uh, technology. The arts develop skills and habits of mind that are important for workers in the new economy of ideas. You'd expect me to say that, but Alan Greenspan is the person who said that. And the conference board, the National Organization for Information for Business, says that the number one way for students to become creative, to become innovative, uh, is the, having the arts in their curriculum as part of their lives, the number one way. Um, you take a look at art being employed worldwide as part of the healing process. In hospitals, 50% of American hospitals today use the arts as part of the healing tools. And uh, with our returning military, uh, wounded warriors, as the wounded service people that you see in this picture um, were participants in a Walter Reed a Hospital Arts Program performing here with Yo-Yo Ma at a lecture that he gave for Americans for the Arts last year, the Nancy Hanks lecture. Um, and in 1990, Maya Angelou gave that lecture for us, uh, and she passed away this morning in case anybody did not know that, but a longtime friend along with many other artists. Um, wonderful different ways that nobody knows the arts has been involved. So art was literally a secret weapon in World War II. Uh, World War II. This is not a tank. Uh, this is a piece of inflatable sculpture. Um, it was uh, created by the military, created by the 23rd Army Special Forces, which was nicknamed the Ghost Army, uh, made up entirely of 1,100 artists, visual artists, actors. I learned about this from uh, an event like this where we were honoring the great visual artist Ellsworth Kelly and he was talking about his service in the Ghost Army in World War II. And it's no wonder none of us knew about it. It was so valuable, a secret weapon, it was classified until 1998. Um, don't forget about the older Americans. I was told that by my mother, who you see here. Uh, I told you this was a, a home slideshow. So uh, she turned 90 this weekend. She took up painting at 80. And then um, uh, this last month, she was ready for her first gallery art show. Uh, and what she, uh, what she illustrates and what is true is that art is a way for our aging population to stay connected and engaged and enjoy uh, a longer life. There's all kinds of statistics that show that, but mom shows it uh, to me as well. Um, and there's also economic impact from this because Diane and, and mom decided there ought to be some snacks and so they went out and uh, put a few things together. 
So multiply this, though, over the last 25 years, uh, over um, the next 25 years. Over 65 population, people over 65 years of age, will increase by almost 80%, the aging boomers. 75 million baby boomers control 2.3 trillion in annual spending. Um, that is uh, half of the total U.S. consumption. That's a market, and that's something important for us to think about related to what those people want. And also, from a demographic uh, shift point of view, the growth of multicultural America. Um, this year, one-third of the U.S. population will be African-American, Latino, Asian-American. 50% uh, of all children in the U.S. under the age of five come from this group. Now, there are a lot of things that um, I could talk to you about. We have limited time. Uh, when the Arts Fund was founded, I was doing research, um, and you can see where I was up in the right-hand corner there. Um, my brother was doing additional research, um, uh, but as any English major, once I got out of college, read Steinbeck and uh, uh, Kerouac and Kesey and Coleridge, um, the only thing I had as a goal uh, in 1973 was to uh, buy a Volkswagen bus and head out on the road for a year. And uh, I came through Seattle at that time and was able to learn firsthand uh, about the, the treasures of this place and also um, understood uh, the power of travel and tourism, which was great preparation for my role on this board, the U.S. Travel and Tourism Advisory Board. But what I was able to say in this picture where I'm making a presentation to the uh, Secretary um, Penny Pritzker was simply this. Uh, tourism in America is a 2.8% GDP. And that's wonderful, and that's my job here to talk about that. The arts are a 3.2% GDP. So pay attention to our sector. It is important. Uh, it is big. Um, one of the things that is important to, to know is where does the money for the arts come from? And you see here that we have to be working on three fronts. The big one there is earned income, 60%. So people do need to know about marketing and do need to know how to sell things and put people in seats. Um, the top area is 9%. That's government, uh, federal, state, and local, with local being the big one. And the bottom chunk there is the private sector, 31%, with most of it being individuals. We are very, very diversified, and that becomes uh, increasingly and important. Um, so with this, um, there are other uh, parts of the slideshow that I'm not going to show you, but I am going to simply say this. What is the problem that we have here? What is the problem uh, in America? Well, why do we still struggle to convince some in whatever sector uh, about the value of the arts? The arts create jobs. The arts provide tourism. The arts have uh, economic activity. The arts um, are, in, are embraced by our U.S. military. Uh, the best schools employ them, and the result is better grades proven again and again. Mayors and county commissioners use them to develop their communities. Drive into any uh, community in America, and you will see the public art that draws people in. You will see the airports transformed. Um, you will see the arts districts where investment in the arts has paid off. Uh, business knows uh, that this creates a competitive edge. The National Business Organization says it. Presidents like John Adams and uh, Thomas Jefferson and uh, George Washington, all the way up to John Kennedy and George Bush and President Obama, have all touted the value of the arts. But we have kept the secret weapon too secret, and you here can make that difference. I often remind myself of a few historical facts. The election of Thomas Jefferson, the election of Rutherford B. Hayes, um, the uh, election a uh, of Andrew Johnson and the beheading of Charles I of England. What did they have in common? I learned this from an important research tool, Parade Magazine. Um, <laughs> they all, what they had in common was they all happened by one vote. That was particularly troubling for Charles I. Um, <laughs> but the point is you can have an effect you as an individual, you as this table, you as this room can have a huge effect. There's a book that I love, uh, How the Irish Saved Civilization. They not only taught us about great parties, um, but uh, it points out great, great truths, like how the Irish invented the term 
Well, yes and no. Um, that's because there's no word for yes or no in the Gaelic language. But more importantly, it points out how the Irish monks kept thought alive and art and literature from being destroyed in the Dark Ages. Whether we like it or not, you here are the guardians and the gateways to thought and, and to uh, treasures, preserving the old ones and launching the new ones in the 21st century. You bring what people get. And uh, the return on that investment is a better child, a better town, a better America, and a better world. There's an oath, um, the oath of the Athenian citizen that this gathering reminds me of, and that is this. From all of your work, in all of the areas, including the arts, we pledge to transmit this city not the same as, but better than, not as beautiful as, but more beautiful than when it was transmitted to us. That's the mission that I see. That's the feeling that I get from the awards that were given. Um, the arts are important. You here are all important. You are powerful far more than you, you might realize. You are the future, and you are not alone. Thank you.